other experiences of Islam in the Middle East and elsewhere, added elements of cosmopolitanism, recognized other cultures and other influences. Right. But there has been this tension, nonetheless, between the purists on the one hand yes. and the more open views on the other hand. Yes. How do you assess the balance between those currents, not associating them particularly with right. particular groups today, but how do, you, how do you assess the balance between those forces in modern Islamic societies? Right. I think that as a rule of thumb, the thrust of Islamic history 1400 years when Muslims did not feel threatened the cosmopolitan v version if you like or nature of Islam was predominant in the modern period though Muslims have felt and have said themselves to feel under threat and when they are in that posture then the purest the more intolerant version of the religion comes out and this happens to also correspond this this, this feeling of, of being beleaguered and under threat happens to correspond just serendipitously uh, to the fact that the richest part of the Muslim world today happens to be the Gulf and Saudi Arabia in particular. So the origins of this um, fairly intolerant version of the religion um, also happens to be the richest part of the Muslim world today and therefore is able to um, have tremendous influence on other Muslims. Uh, because of the money, because of the institutions that they've built, and so on. One of the things that's so interesting in looking at your work and the work of other scholars on these issues is there is this extraordinarily vital ongoing debate within the Muslim world conducted in Arabic and other Muslim languages, which in a pre-9-11 world I don't think we were paying much attention to as a society. Now, of course, we're trying to pay attention to it, but I'm not sure that we have the context or the means of really grasping it. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I think it's important to emphasize the fact of this vitality, that this is an ongoing you know, exploration of some kind. And yes. I wondered if you could characterize it in some way in terms of the means it uses to explore these ideas, the influences and how they flow back and forth across these societies, including into Western societies, which now have significant mu Muslim populations. Right. I, I mean, there, it is absolutely true that there is a debate amongst Muslims, and not just amongst Muslims in the world, but actually amongst the Wahhabis themselves. Within Saudi Arabia, you have a debate as to the nature of the religion, and recently the Saudis decided that some 40,000 of their preachers and religious teachers were going to be re-educated, so that a, a different version of Wahhabism would be taught to them, one presumably that would be much more tolerant and that would excise the bits that, 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 um, that the, even the state itself finds to be unacceptable today. So the, this debate is ongoing and it's made that much more intense by the fact that Muslims, at least the intellectuals and the middle classes, are plugged into the internet. So the internet has broken down the monopoly on information that most states in the Middle East and the Arab world in particular have had historically on the flow of information, the exchange of ideas and so on. So you have a very vibrant debate between many different kinds of Muslims, Sufis, um, liberals, um, jihadis, Salafis of various kinds, even people who are traditional, traditionalists. Um, and uh, you find this, the, the most vibrancy takes place you know, in internet postings on various websites um, and various publications that can be downloaded off the internet. Now, the Western diaspora of Muslims, that the Muslims in the West are certainly um, reading a lot of this stuff. Much of it is being translated as well into various European languages and, um, and is being influenced. But th we don't have ac an accurate sense of um, what the Internet has done and is doing to um, the balance of views and whether one particular version of the religion is trumping another or not. So it's, it is a period of great flux um, and one in which I think increasingly as a result of 9-11 because Arab states have decided um, that this, this version that Al-Qaeda adheres to is unacceptable. It's both unacceptable in terms of the relationship between Muslims and the West but it's also unacceptable domestically because you have to remember that Al-Qaeda has attacked or Al-Qaeda like people have attacked other Muslims within Muslim societies. So once those states, and the, those states are not to be, they're not uh, negligible in terms of their power and their influence. Once these states um, 
uh, mobilize themselves forcefully against this ideology, as I think many, if not all, have done, then you will see a decline in Al-Qaeda's um, influence, as we see, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, where both uh, where, where Al-Qaeda has been crushed militarily um, and to some extent ideologically, but also the fact that the price of oil is at 115, 120 a barrel today um, means that the state has huge means at, as it, at, it, at its disposal to, to deflect people's attentions, to promote other versions of Islam, but also get people interested in economic um, issues rather than theological and legal issues.